ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second lecture of the day for Genetic Genealogy Ireland. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you James Irvin from ISOG. Now, James is going to be talking to us about the Scots-Irish case study, the Irwin DNA Project, which is one of the most exciting DNA projects run by Family Tree DNA by virtue of the fact that it is probably the largest surname study in the database. So, James has been an amateur genealogist since the 1950s, brought up in Ulster amongst his maternal Scots-Irish cousins. He later found his paternal ancestors were from Orkney, reputedly descended from the Scottish Borders family of Irving. Since retiring from a career in the shipping industry in 2000, he has written, edited, and published several books including Trace Your Orkney Ancestors, and founded and administered the Clan Irwin Surname DNA Project. So James is going to take us through it today, and there are a lot of slides, but he will rush through them at the beginning to get to the really juicy bits at the end, which relates to what John Cleary was talking about yesterday, and how the whole scenario of uh, genetic genealogy is changing by virtue of the big Y test and this slip tsunami that is causing us intense questioning and uh, discussion. So I would like to you to give a warm welcome to James Irvin, please. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here today. It's my first time back in Dublin for several years. Um, having come from the north, of course, Dublin was a little place in my heart, and it's been lovely to be reminded of some memories of long ago. I've been very lucky as an amateur, like many other administrators, um, to pick up a, a surname project that's proved to be a uh, teach me more about my surname in the last 10 years I've been administering this project than in 50 years of conventional genealogy being interested in the surname. I'm going to be a bit controversial, um, so I hope to leave time for questions and get a kick as to why I'm wrong. I'm not trying to say what we find in this project is the only answer and it's typical for other projects, but I hope you will be able to draw from some of the experiences and lessons that might be, the methodology might be relevant to other surname and indeed haplogroup projects. Uh, also, I'm going to go through the slides fairly quickly. They'll be online, so for people who can't keep up with it, and I, I'm sorry, I'm going to rush through a lot, that'll be a fair number of you, you can read about it online when John's got it online but I want to get through to the juicy bits, as I say, as John said, as Morris said. Right, let's get cracking. Um, oh well, a bit of overview, but as I've said, um, I want to look at the principles. I'm not trying to get you interested in our particular project, but the methods and experiences we've had in, in getting along the line. The surname is from the Scottish Lowlands. Um, there's a good tradition about what happened and all the rest of it. But in fact, it turns out that... Uh, the diaspora is, is very much Irish and, and, and American, and um, the, the, the conventional genealogy is quite, in fact quite weak. We've got a very active clan association which has been instrumental in the size of the project, so I've been very fortunate to be able to tap into that. Um, I'm very conscious that we've still got less, only just over 0.1% of all the urbans in the world. That's not untypical of other projects, but it does illustrate that we're only scraping the the ice, the scrape on the surface of, of, of what we're looking at. Um, we've had terrific growth. We're now up to 19 big Y tests, which as an administrator has been a, a roller coaster of an experience trying to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, we're beginning to come up with some answers that are fairly controversial, and that's what I want to get on to. This is a copy, uh, an 18th century copy of the 17th century history of the family. Uh, we were all brought up to believe that all the Irvins came from one ancestor, a single origin surname, and this is the story of how it happened, written by a historiographer, Her Oil of Scotland, who should be a very eminent fellow, with a strong Irish connection, but he sent it to his brother, who was the laird of uh, Castle Irvin in County Fermanagh. And this is gospel to all the traditional genealogists. In fact, the Bible, yeah, a real Bible. This is the sort of message that it was giving, a lot of different branches in different bits of Scotland, all going back to, if you extrapolate a bit, the town of Irvin in Ayrshire. Uh, you'll see there's one Irish branch, but we're all led to believe that all the others would, would tap into it like that. Now, a surname project should answer some of those questions. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we are an open project at the bottom. Um, 
Well, we, we take anybody. Anybody who's got the surname, and indeed anybody who has a DNA that matches the surname, is very welcome to the study. Once they're in, I start kicking their backsides to get the quality up. I don't say you can't come in until you do this. Um, and it's certainly not dependent on there being a genealogy, and we've got an awful lot of baggage that, that doesn't add genealogically at all. But it does add statistically, and it, it's very relevant, I think. This is the growth. Um, this has virtually been reactive. I've, I've done some promotion, not a lot, but it's just by being there and being on the web, people come in and join the project, and it's been a, a privilege to, to ride this wave. Now, before we even start analyzing the DNA data, there's a lot of work you can do with this, these people who join. And you see we've got 390 uh, people. 76% of them come from, or indeed over 80% come from America, and only 1% come from Ireland. And we, you might say, what the hell am I doing standing here today talking to you about Irish matters when only 1% of my flock come from Ireland? I'll show you why that's not relevant in a minute, but I'm hopeful I will get one Irish Irwin to sign up this afternoon. I haven't got one yet. But in fact, there are very few Irwins in Ireland. And to get a feel of how relevant this is, if you take the population and compare the two ratios, you can get a, what I call penetration. And you'll see that the Amer America, as one would expect, is quite strongly represented. I've made an effort to get the Scottish representation up to a similar level so we don't have too much bias. And we're a bit weak on Ireland, but not quite so bad. Um, and again, I'll show that isn't too important. But anybody can do this. It takes a bit of work. But I think it is very important you do have a feel for any bias that is in your project. Um, if you don't understand that, you're going to be misleading yourself, let alone other people. Now, just from the membership of the project, this is going not from where people live, but where they thought their earliest ancestor was. And all the people who can identify a county in the 400 that I've got, um, this is the spread. Now, the green bits are the bits that we were taught traditionally where we would expect to find Irvins. But if you look at the black numbers, you're seeing a very, very strong prominence about the Scottish borders, south of the border as well as north of the border, and Ulster, indeed old Ulster. Um, some in the south, I'll come to them in a minute. So we're looking at something that fits what we call Scots-Irish. Um, I wasn't looking for this. I sort of intuitively knew it, but I wasn't looking for it. So what are the Scots-Irish? Now, there's a lot on this slide, and I pick my words very carefully. It's a very complex and controversial subject. But basically, typically, we're talking about people who came from Scotland, southwest Scotland, to Ulster in the, in the 17th century. Um, variety of reasons. Um, others came later, of course, and, and all the rest of it. But the majority came then. Um, they came as landowners or tenants. Um, the landowners were called undertakers because they undertook to have tenants. And they weren't any old tenants, they were Protestant tenants. So they had to be loyal because, of course, the Catholics were being kicked down to the south by this. Now, you know, we all know about the politics, we won't go into that, but this is, the, this is the manifestation of it. So the bulk of the people coming weren't landowners at all, and they didn't have pedigrees. And in fact, a lot of them were, were border reavers, who were criminals, who were, were being caught by the courts once we got a bit more peace with James I and the VI. And they were just in, coming through out of the courts. If they were lucky, they weren't executed. Sometimes whole clans were sent over to Ireland. The Grahams were sent en bloc across, banished from, from Scotland to, to Ireland. And later on, they became Presbyterians. You didn't have Presbyterians at this time. Very few of them, therefore, had pedigrees to take them back to Scotland. Now, the Americans, not all of them, if there are any present, I'm sorry I upset some, but a lot of court say we're, they, they're descended from Scotch-Irish. We all know, of course, that Scotch is a drink, but, but in America, it's also used to describe coming from Ireland. They, in turn, didn't have many pedigrees to link them back to Ireland. Some did, but not many. So we're dealing with a bulk of the people having no pedigrees at all, maybe within America, but not linking them back to Ireland, or, and certainly not, or very, very unlikely back to Scotland. I think there's only one out of the three, 260 I've got who can take a pedigree back from, is American, from America back to Scotland. It's only one out of 260, and that's a special one. So it's the antithesis of what a lot of the uh, more traditional surname projects are looking at. We are looking at low quality material from a genealogical point of view, but we can make a lot of it nonetheless. 
Now, the spelling of the name, of all surnames, people get excited about. It does mean something at times. I mean, the Irwins with a U, I know, come from Northumberland and Durham. Um, and other ones in Scotland, I can have a bit of a guess. But by the time you get to Ireland, and particularly to America, the, surname, the spelling has got so corrupted, it's just misleading. And, and you've just got to accept that it's, it's, it's noise and recognize that where, the, where you end up, things like Arnwin is actually a German surname, but it's got mixed up, and there are Scottish people with Scottish ancestry that have got a German surname, but they're mixed up. And similarly, as I've said, the pedigrees generally don't go back very far. We're lucky we've got some that go back way, way back to 1323s who would have been born in the 1200s, but most not very good. Now, all, is that, all of that is a discussion before we start looking at DNA, but what you can get out of a DNA study. When we start going into the DNA, you've got to think about quality, and this is very relevant. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of 12 marker tests. My most interesting result is a 12 marker test, um, but you've got to be very careful how you handle it, particularly if you're dealing with statistics. And we're up to 93% now of 37 markers. Now, when you get your results, most people are happy to take the FTDNA spreadsheet and, and, and work with that. I, am, I, I find that just totally inhibiting. I've got to put it onto my own spreadsheet and start working with it. And this is the sort of data you get. It's very similar at this stage to what FTDNA give you. But you'll see we're getting clusters, not exact matches, but the second one you can see very clearly. It's very different to the first one, but the two match each other quite clearly. And then other ones and examples. And one at the bottom is Singleton. He doesn't match anybody, but he's got the Owen surname. Um, so that's how I start to handle it. Now, before I go into how I work further, I've got to go back to some basics. And this is where I'm going to skim through very quickly because it's uh, slightly controversial, so I don't do it the way most people do it, but you can read about it on the slide. So I've got three lots of things to get at. I look at genetic distance and I just get sick. I'm sorry. It's simple as that. Um, you're comparing things. It's like saying, what's the average size of a bit of fruit when you've got a mixture of apples and cherries? Um, you've got to be more sophisticated than saying it's just four apples, four and two make six, so we'll average it. They're much more complicated than that. Um, I use tips. Now, tips have got lots of disadvantages, and I don't know how tips work, because it's a commercial proprietary thing that FTDNA won't tell us. But it gives me a single parameter that takes into account all the things that worry me, and I don't care whether it's accurate or not, relative to the other ones, it's using the same yardstick, and I want a, symbol, a single simple yardstick to work from, so it suits me. It's the 12 generation one I use uh, to the nearest whole number. I won't go into the detail, it's a specialist thing. Genetic distance, I find, is, is people have different yardsticks. When you look at different projects, they have different rules. FTDNA used the 1247, which John Cleary calls the 10% rule. Now, I don't think it's as simple as that. I don't think that's how they derived it, but it, what it boils down to is 10%. And when you look at my data and apply the 10% rule, I find 7% of the crystal clear matches FTDNA have said are not matches. And I just say that's too simplistic. They've got a very crude, a very useful, extremely useful, but a very crude compromise to look at matches of matching surnames and completely different surnames, and one criteria to judge them. And it's too, for me, it's too simplistic. You've got to, I think you've got to be more lax when you're happy about the surname but much more stringent when you're not happy about the surname. Um, I then go into matrices and more definitions. Let's go on to this one. This is a very interesting slide. The blue line is the growth of the project. You see for 10 years it's grown pretty steadily. Don't ask me why. We've been lucky and maybe I've been diligent. The singletons, these are the leftovers that have no matches. You see at the beginning they were 50%. At the beginning, 50% of the people I couldn't match. Well, by definition, when you've only got two people, you probably won't match them. And that grew, not proportionately, but for about the first three years, we were only getting one genetic family, and the singletons were going up. Then the second phase, for about three years, the number of singletons come down because the number of genetic families that I identified is going up. And then the third phase, which I like to think of as maturity, Maybe I'm a bit naive, but for the last six years we've had hardly any more genetic families, even though, and hardly any more singletons, even though the number coming in. So now when I get a, an every marginal new participant, I'm very comfortable that I'll be able to tell him by return which bit of Scotland he came from. It's as simple as that. Not 100% confident, but very comfortable to say with a few small caveats, this is probably the way it is, and I haven't yet had to eat my hat, which I don't like doing. 
Right, now I want to talk about NPEs. A whole variety of synonyms here, very emotive. Um, I like the one at the bottom, a surname discontinuity event, because there's all sorts of moral overtones and, and, and so forth. I have three different sort of hierarchy of three. It came from, from the geneticists who use NPEs in, in surrogacy and illegitimacies and this sort of thing. And we've widened it because when you get two uh, SDR signatures that match, but they have different surnames, um, but they match very well, then prima facie you've quite possibly got an NPE. And a lot of this will be because of quite innocent things like um, a, a young man dying, the mother remarrying, and the stepson taking the name of his step, or the son taking the name of the stepfather. Quite innocent. Um, and then we get some at the bottom, which are a bit more complicated, because if you haven't had a father with a surname, you won't expect to inherit a surname. So right at the beginning of surnames, and when when, when surnames are becoming hereditary, you've got this sort of grey area. So you have to be a bit careful. It's not just black and white. Now, I get a lot of examples in my project, I'm lucky and it clarifies me, of people with a surname of Elliot but with our DNA, and I get people with our surname but their DNA. I've got a, lot of, a fair number of these, and I'll show you in a minute. And, and somebody else called them egressions and ingressions, ENPEs and INPEs. So when we're talking about NPEs, we can actually be talking about two completely different things. Um, so if you include or don't include NPEs in your project, you've actually got to address two two different issues. This is an example of an ENPE. When you look at your matches, this is a matches page for those that aren't familiar. You see it's predominantly Elliot's, but we're picking up a few Irvins. It's an Elliot up at the top there. That is an Irvin. First one there. This is an Elliot uh, surname, and he's picking up Irvings. And then the obverse is Irvin surname Elliot. We're getting some fair bones, so we're actually getting a third NPE creeping in. And find three, I've even got some four in the line, four NPEs I can trace in one ancestral line. It happens. So uh, one's got to be aware of the possibilities. Um, now there's a, a website, this isn't a very, very uh, high level authority, but this is another uh, genetic analyst saying, in the borders, you've just got to have antennae, you're going to get NPEs, they, they exist, and this is explaining some of the reasons why they exist. Um, handling them, Handling the two types is quite different. If somebody says to you, I want to join your project because I'm an NPE, there's nothing embarrassing about it. They've already crossed that threshold. Obviously, if you're finding that they've, they've got our surname, they've got your surname, but you've got different, different SDA signature, it's a bit more difficult to break it to them. But I've had over 50 of these, and I haven't had a single backlash of saying, are you accusing me of having illegitimate ancestors? If you handle it sensibly, you won't get into trouble. So I argue very strongly that they should all be included. Now, this is going back to the slide we had before. Now, each of these ones is in the order I want to use them. I've shuffled them around. And on the same spreadsheet, I've got this data. And there's all sorts of interesting things coming out. The number on the left is the same. The, the next letter is where they live. So the U is they live in the United States. S, they live in Scotland. The earliest ancestor is the name. Um, some more details, where they came from the haplogroup, the number of the markers they've tested, the genetic distance at 25, 3711, just to show you how the noisy, uh, confusing measure it is, and the tip score, they're all nicely sequenced and you can pair different numbers of markers nicely. Now, starting at the bottom, we've still got a singleton. The next one up is two from Munster, and you'll see I name them with a name that means something. I find this terribly important, just to number them one to 10, doesn't help. These are I for Irish, M for Munster. Two of them, and the top one is lovely. He actually knew his Gaelic surname, and these are the, the Munster people that were being talked about yesterday. And these two are members of that project as well. But they're Irvins, they joined us first, and they're obviously nothing to do with Scots Irish at all. This fellow, he could remember his father speaking Gaelic, he's a Catholic. I mean, it's just obviously nothing to do with, with the, the majority of the, of the Scots Irish Irvins. Next up, some Orkney ones. One of them's me, and my tenth cousin was a descendant of the, not of Washington Irving, who didn't have any children, but of one of his brothers, which for me was significant. Um, an Elliot, a couple of Elliots here, the Irwin surname, but they match Elliots perfectly. And then also in pink up in the, in the Irvings, we've got an Elliot who is uh, clearly an Irving. 
DNA-wise. So this is an example of the two types of NPE. Um, the block in red is telling us that these ones came from Dumfrieshire. I call it the borders because it genetically were covering Northumberland, Durham, and, and um, uh, Cumberland as well. Now, along the right, we've got some interesting things. We've seen the MPEs. The little blue one, you see he's a, a 37 markers. He's got a genetic distance of five. So he does not appear in FTDNA's matches page. And when you go up to 67 and, and 111, he's coming back in again. But um, you get them at the, those thresholds as well. And then up a, in, in purple, I've got two full brothers, genetic distance of two at 25. Genetic distance is a very crude measure. And the mother of those two guys said to me, are you accusing me of sleeping with two different men? And I said, no, this proves you didn't. <laughs> but they do have a genetic distance of two as full brothers. Bennett Greenspan is exactly the same problem, so I'm not unique in this at all. Genetic mutations are random, and sometimes they happen all, all, awfully quickly. We have found some fifth cousins and sixth cousins, but they're pretty rare. And this block at the top, you see all those noughts and 100%. Um, we've got this huge block of ones that I'll, I'll come to. So this is the, some of the things I'm coaxing out of the data, even though I've got relatively little genealogical data to play with. Now, this is the most important slide that comes out of the study. We've got a total of 30 genetic families. Um, a lot of them are NPEs, the INPEs in the borders, and they're scattered around. The African one is the interesting one. This is fascinating. 12 markers, that's all he's got, 12 markers. He came up, I'm, I'm haplogroup E, and I'd never heard of haplogroup B. Give me a bit more detail. We're very proud of the fact that our great-grandfather was an emancipated slave. And I was able to say, well, it probably his slave master was an Irvin from the Scottish borders. Hallelujah, he said, and hallelujah, I said, was I've not just got the classic, you know, fairly right-wing, middle American, Scots-Irish, but um, I've actually got some black African Irvins as well. So we really are heterogeneous. Um, but the most important thing is that this top group has got three, uh, has got 66% of the project is, is this top group. 260 of them with a common surname, and this is what I think is the biggest of any surname project. I'm terribly privileged to, to, to have this, um, and I'll be deep going into this in a bit more detail. But if you add up the NPs on the right, so something like 15%, and the NPs across the top, this is double counting actually, to add them together, but you can get up to 30% in a project that may be NPEs. In other words, in this room, if my figures are right, about a third of us are NPEs of one sort or another. So it's not as rare an animal as you may think. We may be exceptional, you may be squeaky clean, but I suspect none of us are quite as comfortable as we would like to think we are. May include me as well. But it's just like conventional genealogy. You find things that didn't modify it. You can't help it. The Irish, uh, Irish surnames textbook identifies one of these, uh, the, the bottom one, the Seamahan. So that's how I knew it was Munster. Um, and then to hear the lecture the, the day before yesterday on the Irish Munster Irvins completely confirms it. Um, that was lovely to pick this up. And I think we may have found the other one. And the third one, I think, may be a subset of, I've got to do some work on it, but it may be a subset of the, uh, the Munster ones. So the native Irish ones I'm able to work on as well, not in the same detail, but it's nice to have the, the backup of independent sources. Now, you remember that we had this, this, this first column of numbers we've had before, um, you, the Americans were dominant. When we get back to the earliest confirmed, the residents, the earliest confirmed ancestor, Ireland was dominant, but when we get through genetics back to where the ancestors came from, Scotland is dominant. So you can see the, the way we're moving from what we know now to what DNA is telling us, and it's giving a completely different picture. And whilst the individual percentages may not be quite right, I suspect they're very typical of a lot of other scots American families that they started in Scotland, went through Ireland, and got to America. Now, you may know this, but an awful lot of our participants say, I can only go back to my genealogy for two generations. Where did I come from? And I can't say they actually went through Ireland, but I can go back to where they came from in Scotland. And they're just over the moon with this. It's just magic. And I can say it with considerable confidence now. So the traditional tree, of course, is torn up. And the X's are where we've had actually proved that not that it was wrong, but it was extremely unlikely it was right. And politically, this was a big bridge five, ten years ago to tell all these 
people who spend years doing their genealogies and worshiping the English Bible of 1678, that it's, it's, it's probably very different. Um, but I've now got this picture, and all these branches coming down here. B is borders, and these suffixes, I'll explain, mean something else. Uh, I've been talking about SDRs now, I'm going to move on to SNPs, and if you don't know the difference, I'm sorry, we're going to move on, you can read about it. Um, this is a lovely slide. Anybody can make this for their surname project. The phylogenetic trees, you can get them from, from FTDNA, you can get them from um, ISOG, but of course there's all sorts of noise. I've taken out of them the ones that are relevant to my project, and if there's a color mutation, it's either a prediction by FTDNA, in um, red, or it's an actual test in green. So each of my 30 uh, genetic families I can fit on this tree. So yes, we are all related. All the Owens are related, but you've got to go back nearly to Adam to get that common bit at the top. There's the African right out on the, on the top left. Uh, the Munster people are right down close to us, quite close. It's the C446 is quite close to us, L5, well, when I say us, the, the big group. I personally am over here at the O1s. Um, this is where I personally come in, so I, I don't actually belong to it, but as an administrator, I say we. Um, so they're all on one tree, and this, this pulls it together. As somebody said in one of the earlier lectures, a tree, we're all familiar with a tree. Anybody can do this. You can see I've put some dates in on the left-hand side. I'm not interested in, in deep ancestry, but this does help put it in perspective what we're talking about. And it keeps needing updating. And I thought I got it up and ready for the lecture, and then I found there are four or five things that have been overtaken by events, so you keep having to update it. Generally, you're moving people down the tree as more tests are done, and converting from, from um, the predictions in red into green. And if you find, of course, another family, you've got to fit it on. SF was a singleton. Um, now, before Big Y came along, I thought, I've got this huge family, quite a responsibility, quite an opportunity. So I invited some gurus to help me with, with network diagrams. And they, this is the best we came up with. Now, you can make these prove anything if you want to, because you can weight them. And how you weight them, you can do it with no weighting at all, um, and you get one picture. But then you say, if, some of the, if, these genetic, if these markers mutate at different rates, you ought to give them different weightings. And you can make that paint any picture you want. But this is the best we came up with. And you can see from the colors that it does represent roughly some groupings. And from that, I was able to go on and divide my Borders family, the 260 of them, into 10 groups, or 11 groups, um, and give them each a label. The first one is the mode. So I've got this big bulk that are all the same. That's the mode, the most common for the whole lot, 34 of them. And then the DYS that was the predominant one, and then at the other end I've got the unassigned. There's quite a bit left over at the end, about a third of them, um, or maybe it's down to a quarter now, that uh, were left over and we couldn't, we couldn't map. They all had US descendants, a lot of them had Irish ancestors. Some of them I can say which bit of Dumfrieshire they came from. Some of them are very characteristic of an NPE. The, the Elliots all seem to cluster within our family got the part of the Borders family, but all the Elliots are in one tight group, so this NPE will have occurred a long time ago. And some of them I, I just named by the, the, uh, the DYS number. And then this, this, this network diagram will give you a time to most recent common ancestor. I didn't, wasn't very comfortable with it, and you can look at the earliest genealogy, I'll come back to that. But this is where we were before Big Y. Huge big tree, how does it fit together? You would expect there to be some hierarchical element in this, and we can see which is the son metaphorically of the others. And L55 was our private SNP, which was identified in 2012, um, confirmed by ISOG, and we're very lucky to have a, a private SNP. And after three years, nobody else has put, no other, no other surname has claimed membership of this, um, of this SNP. They will do one day, but uh, given the rate of growth, it's after three years, I'm fairly comfortable that, uh, like some other surnames, uh, we've effectively got was probably a private SNP. Now, Big Tree comes along, and uh, we're very fortunate in the L21s. We've got Alec Williamson, if you've been to previous lectures, you'll have heard about him. This was updated this week. I managed to get a squeeze it out of him. And you can see my 12 big Ys all here in the first two blocks. All of those are Irvins. There's one NPE in them, but this stage, we're not worried about that. And this is what Alex Williamson has come up with. Now, 
frankly, that's as much as you're going to get out of Big Y, probably, I thought. And why waste? And the number of hours I put in is just uncountable, but I've enjoyed doing it, so that's why I've done it. Um, but Alex Williamson said he was going to pack up. He was going to stop doing this. Thank God he did, because if he had packed up, I said to myself, I've got to be able to do it myself. So I've learned out how to make a, an Alex Williamson tree. I'll come to that in a minute, show you how. Um, but I now can stand on my feet and tell Alex Williamson, in fact, I gave him the, the prototype. He came back, completely reworked it. We differ on a, quite a number of very minor details, but I've produced it independently of him, and he's come back and confirmed my work, though, in fact, of course, it's the other way around. I'm confirming his work in advance. Um, so I'm very comfortable that, that independently we're, we're coming to a similar conclusion. Now, when I process what he's done into my format, you'll see we've got the bit I've been talking about, the L555. We've got a lot of surnames over on the right that were on the right of that one I've just shown you, which come off higher above our private L55, um, and one would expect to be getting surnames coming off lower down, but they haven't come yet. And to the left, we've got five Irvin big wide test results, but they're not from the borders. We've got there on the fourth one in is the, the Munster one, the Irvin Munster one. So that's going to be very interesting for the Munster group, but I frankly haven't got time to, to work on that. I'm working on this big lot. Um, so we've got the answers coming out. The, the ones at L55, there's a big block there, and then we've got one into what I call an intermediate, and then we've got the private snips of all these 12 that we've now got tested. Now, what we're going to do initially, I thought all we're going to do, I've put it together on a cloud account, Alex Williamson can analyze it, and I can sit back. Alex Williamson says, I'm going to pack up. Christ, I've got to do it myself. So I focused on the big family. We, went, we haven't got tests for all of these branches, so I actually, for the first time ever, suggested that somebody did some tests. And at $600, $500 a time, six off, that's quite a... Quite a a recommendation to make with responsibilities arising. Um, work it all through, and I've now found that interesting results, but of course, like everything in life, you get more information, but you find you need more to get back to where you thought you'd be. So I'm now, this week, asked Bennett Greenspan for a private surname pack that I can apply to all the people of this genetic family who haven't taken a big white test. Instead of spending $500, they can spend $100, and we'll take a lot, a lot further down the line. And I'll show you why in a minute. I'm not interested in all this noise about how you name a variant, an SMP, who, whether it's named by this company or that company, whether it's Y or, or whatever. I'm not interested in, in other people's um, phylogenetic trees and adding onto them. I want to understand what we're doing. Then I will start telling the world what we're doing, publicly as it were, but I don't want people drawing my trees on their trees for only me to find out only a week later that now that we've got a bit more information we've got to change it. Although it's not that I don't like participating, but I just don't want to do it yet. And this keeps me out of a lot of the noise that goes on about the arguments about why this isn't happening and why somebody's done something and so forth. Now, when you try to do it yourself, as I've done, you've got to look at it a bit analytically. You do a big Y test. FTDNA give you BAM data, which is a huge big file. Somebody will tell me how long it is, but it takes several hours to download if you, if you want to do it in raw data. You can get it zipped and all the rest of it. And then you could, the different tools they give you. And they, FTDNA give you a, a VCF file and a CSV file. The VCF file is gobbledygook. The CSV file is pretty long, but you can begin to digest it. And then you give you a matches file. This is an even cruder simplification, which actually I also don't understand. But if you don't want to spend a lot of effort, you've got something in one page you can digest. And you can go out and have an analysis done by FGC or WIFOL, and it's not currently clarify, you pay $50 for those. All of those are algorithms, you plug the data in, somebody's given it some rules, and out come some fairly simple answers. Or you can do it yourself, and you find you get different answers. Not radically different, but frankly, I would not spend a penny of, of those files for quality. I need those, that work that's been done to identify which ones to look at, but they're not comprehensive, as I'll show you. And when it comes to quality, I prefer my own rules. Not because the other rules are wrong, but you've got to adapt them. It's like looking at a money picture and saying to a computer, describe that money picture in, in 12 digits. What, what do you want? Do you want greens? Do you want how many purples there are? You know, we're asking the computer to do things that we don't understand. Of course the computer can't do it. It can do it pretty well, 
but not as well as the human eye, I would argue. So I've worked out a little process, and what we're trying to do is to find out the variants, identify the variants that are high up the tree, because they're all cluttered up with the ones you're interested in, the ones of the L55 block, intermediate ones and private ones, and then I've got to look at the probability, the quality, and it's the number of reads in existence, and I'll go into this in a bit of detail, and then I update the tree. Um, so I list in black all the variants. A, SNP, a variant is a SNP or something that isn't a SNP that they call an indel. We won't worry about indels because we're told not to worry about them. And to use the BAM viewer, which is a tool that you can use as an amateur, you've got to work with numbers. So the ones that have already been, the variants that have already been named, CTS or FGC or L21, you've got to go back to the, the original position number to be able to use the tool. So, the fact that it's been called L55 or L21 or whatever it is, actually you've got to get rid of that to use this tool. And then you put in the two uh, letters characterizing the, the uh, two base ones, and then you go into this table, and for each one I pull out three digits, the number of reads, the number of indels, and the consistency, I'll explain that. And what we're looking for is consistency across the line. So you can see this example has got A's and G's, and this is the intermediate one. If it's L555, you expect to be all the same letter, it would be wherever it is, it would be T's all the way across. Um, or if they're private, then they'd, they'd be all different, but it'd be ones just unique to that one, I'll show you. So that's what you're starting trying to do. And then you look into the BAM viewer, it's online. Once you know how to use it, it's a piece of cake. I can set this up in 10 minutes. Most of that is while the computer's thinking, it's handling an awful lot of data. I can almost do it from memory, it's quite simple. When you look at it in that vertical column, immediately it's saying there's something funny about the second third and the three, three from the bottom. It's different, that's what we're looking for. And in the particular one it's clicked on, there's an arrow that doesn't come out in the slide, but that particular green box at a count of 32, it, it, was, a, it was an A, the second base letter was an A, it was a count of 32, and its quality was 94%, 94%. So those are the digits I'm looking for. And I do that for everyone in that line. And then I do, do that, that's just for one variant, and then I've got to do that for all the variants I'm interested in. So I end up with this huge amount of data. But there's some patterns coming out. You'll see the intermediate one, it's about the third block down, it's, it's got a square around it, there's an A, then two Gs, and then three As, that's the intermediate one. The ones above it are blocks right the way across. The ones below, we're getting boxes for each of the particular testees. They're the, the private ones for each of them. Now the interesting bit is where you draw that bottom line, because if we look at the, I'm gonna to have to use the pointer to do this. Here we are. Down here, I use a capital letter if it's good quality and a small letter if it isn't. Now that's a small letter, but you see it's only 70% consistency. Um, so that's below my 85% threshold. It's about this threshold, 85% is about what other people use. So it doesn't qualify quality-wise. Otherwise, right the way across, they're all C's, and it would be different, so it'd be, it would be in that box. But in this box here, yes, there's a little A that I have included, which is inconsistent, but you'll see it's 84%. It's only one below my 85%, but I've included it because, to me, if the, if the test had just been a bit more rigorous, and this is how they handle the thing in the lab, it's not a subjective thing, um, it would have easily, easily um, uh, it probably would have gone up to 85% or more. Um, and you've got to look at each of them as to whether you include them. Up here, and there's an, a potential intermediate there, you'll see it's pretty low grade, and of course it's contradictory to the other intermediate, which would mean couldn't draw a tree, it's, it's, it's all mixed up. Now, there's a lot to digest here, there's no rules, but to me, um, I was getting comfortable that I can predict something, and when Alex Williamson comes up with virtually the same answer, I'm obviously doing roughly the right thing. Um, that's just 20 variants for six participants. When you look at 100 variants for 12 participants, you're getting something like this. It's getting even more noisy, but the same principle you've got the big blocks, this is the top bit, and that's the L555 block there, and these ones that are all about for the low quality. The green lines are where I used FGC and WIFO. I didn't use them, but the participants wanted to check my work or before I could do it. 
and they were not coming up with what I call, they were coming up with interesting and useful and, and fairly reliable answers, as, certainly as reliable as mine, but they weren't coming up with what I would call comprehensive answers. So contrary to what John says, I don't say recommend that you use them. I would then say, John and I agree on this, if you do use them, use both of them. If you're going to spend $50, I'd spend $100. Um, but I would still recommend you do it yourself. And if you've got the patience and the skills to be able to do what I've done without any training, I think you'll get a much more, it's addictive, it's like all genealogy. Once you get the hang of it and you've got data, it's addictive. Once I start on it, I can't put it down. It's just so exciting. You don't I have found SNPs myself by chance, just on that screen, is sitting there looking at me, shouting at me. No computers find it. I find it. It's about discovering America. I have done that myself. Nobody saw me how to do it. And it's in there, and Alex Williams says, says, well done. Nobody else found it. You found it. The thrill is fantastic. <laughs> just by chance. Not by skill, by chance. And so that's the bottom half. And here we're picking up the four of them, these blocks that are, uh, that if you look at them, the coloring, that's red, that this first one, just drop it in. There's, that's red, green, 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 all the way across, or yellow, 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 all the way across, so that's why it's in the box, and that's the same. That one's yellow, green, 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 all the way across. Get the hang of it eventually. Nearly there at the end. So I get something that's very similar to what Alex Williamson came up with. Bit of difference, I've got some question mark ones that I, I'm not sure about, so I give them a sort of 50% probability. Um, but you'll see I'm, I'm getting some um, similar answers. The L55 block at the top, there's one intermediate, and beginning to get a feel that, that I'm getting a, an indication of what I should expect for my different uh, subgroups within this name. And you'll see there's a bit of a slant there in finding they've got different ages. Now, this age business is very interesting. TRMCA, time the most recent ancestor, very simple to calculate, as I said last night. You just get, the answer is in years, the number of SNPs in a, in a vertical line from whatever you're measuring, times the average number of years for SNP. But you've got to remember you're dealing with probabilities, so if you're dealing with a, if you're dealing with a number and you can average them, you're going to get a much more reliable answer. If you're only dealing with one, it's going to be unreliable. And how unreliable would you believe? Um, the difficulty is because the average number of years for SNP, 118, 120, that difference doesn't matter, but you can get 60s and 130s, and there's some work on that. And I, as I'm identifying, what is the SNP? Is it 84%? Is it 85%? It makes a little bit of difference, a huge difference, but it's, it's something that needs investigating, I think. So let's try. Here we have the, the, um, what I've got. And um, the first thing to note, that I could have done earlier, we had big, what I call a starburst at just below L21, a huge spread of new SNPs. And then, after a couple of generations, I've got a block of 20 SNPs all in the vertical line. We don't know what, what the sequence within that is. And if we're talking about 120 years of SNP, that's two and a half thousand years of no forecation in the survivors of the people that are tested. Now, of course, some of that is because we've only tested a minute number of people. But you'll see if you look at Alex Williams' work, these blocks appear time after time. And then, underneath that, I get another starburst huge lateral spread, unlike John who's getting a lot of hierarchy, I'm getting the entire, my entire genetic family developed within apparently two SNP generations, um, which I find strange, um, not comfortable with it at all. The, what I do is I add the number of probables and half the number of possibles, and the left one gives me 11 SNPs, 11 times um, 120 will come to 2,000. 400, whatever it is. Um, I'll do each one individually in a minute. I add them all up, divide them by 12, and that gives me an average of 6.3. Well, uh, yeah, um, 11, 8.5, so add them up. It's an average of 6.3. Oh, yeah. And I get about 750 years, take that away from 1950, which is the average age of birth of my participants. And so we, we get the age of my L55 block as about. Um, 1,200, I would guess it would have been 1,300, so it's not too bad. And if we do the with L21, we're getting about BC 2,000, exactly the same as somebody mentioned last night. Not seeing exactly that, but a gut feel I seem to be on the right track. So that's very comforting. When we come to the individual ones down at the bottom, we're getting a huge amount of noise because 
11 snits, of course, takes us back to about AD 600, and one probable snit takes us back to about 1700. Um, so that, that just doesn't make sense at all. But that's because, I'm sure, we're looking at only one individual one. When I get the SMP packs, we get five or six under, the, under each of those. I think it'll smooth itself out and I'll get a better picture. The, in small print, I've got the old ones that were done by 2011 from the network analysis and my earliest genealogies. You see three from the end of all coming up, lady 1700. Oh, nice, but I think that's good. Cool. Right. Some further reading, if you want to look at it. Um, some findings about the project, I won't bore you with that. I just want to use my last minute to go to findings that might be relevant to other surnames. Small projects can learn a lot from large projects. I couldn't have done this if I wasn't lucky to be in a large project, but other people can learn from my experience. Spelling is misleading, penetration ratios, easy to do, gives you a bit of a check. Matches, be careful. I'm not saying don't use them, I'm not saying they should make a mistake. But just bear in mind they're not quite as gospel as they might have been. Tip scores, I think, are a great tool. NPEs certainly do consider them. They're not as embarrassing as you think. Big Y, terribly cumbersome to handle. Um, but Band-Aid, they give you some very exciting results. I hope my enthusiasm has infected you, inspired you. Starburst and bottlenecks, are they population explosions? Are they something genetic? We don't know. And we need SNP backup, so I, I'm asking for the first surname SNP backup. If I pack back up, if I get it, I'll be lovely. If I don't, I've got to go to YSEC, which is a little sweat, even though it's cheaper. And at the bottom, tongue in cheek, if you read that bottom block, what I'm saying is you don't have to be an expert in genetics. If you're fairly good at other things, you can get an awful long way, and you've got to be lucky. Perhaps I should have added luck, it's the most important thing of all. I've been extremely lucky. But that doesn't mean you can't be lucky, or you can learn from my luck. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, who would like to kick off asking a question for James? <laughs> okay, we've got two. Let's uh, go for Arch first. Um, so maybe you said this, but I can dismiss it. But the, <laughs> the, the estimating the origins, um, it's talked about 120 years per common SNP or 118. Where does that? How do you calculate that? Oh, I don't calculate that. I'm, I'm not an expert. I've inherited that. And much as I said, and I think using other people's work, you've got to use some. And I take that as a given. Whether it's right or not, doesn't worry. I'm much more interested in giving the, a comfort, an answer I'm comfortable with. Right. Where I got it from was a couple of emails on chat shows and this sort of thing. Um, John Cleary will tell you which papers to refer to to find the origins. But it's, 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 not, it's not blogging that said it. These are those stuff, 120 years. Dennis Wright, my full, and FTDNA use those numbers. They're authority. They wouldn't say they're right. That's just the work, pleasant work and figure. And um, from what I've heard from Nigel McCarthy, the way that he has calculated the time is that uh, we know that L21 was about 4,000 years ago, about 2,000 BC. So how do we know that? I don't know. <laughs> you see? <laughs> but then you count how many slips were there for between 4,000 yeah. years ago and your test T, let's say there were 21, then you divide that distance of 4,000 years by 21 and that arrives yeah. as an yeah. average you know the same. of 130 or whatever it is. That's the crude thing. John has a, something to add about that? No, we, no, not not yet. We're saving. You're saving the good bits. Okay. Um, we have a question. Like, does that more or less answer your question, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not an exact science, but we're getting more exact as time goes on. Uh, for a presentation, just wondering what is the exact status of um, Alex's tree, Alex Williamson's tree, and if he drops it, are you going to pick up the relay? <laughs> I, p I pick it up for the Irvins, absolutely, because I, I feel I can. Um, but I put it, I'm run off my feet just doing what I'm doing. How he does it, I, I've got an idea. He, he works from CSVs, he doesn't work from BAM. And he's got an algorithm that he interprets quite liberally. Um, but as I understand it, he's not thinking of giving up now. Thank God he's scared that he was, but I think he's going on. But it's a huge work, though. And I mean, you know. He says, oh, I'm away, I can't do it this week. If I give him six at a time, I don't dribble it in, you see. So I give him six times as much work, so I go to the bottom of the queue. Um, 
but it is human, and it's an, it's an unpaid amateur like us all, uh, it's got to find the time. But it seems to want to go on with it, thank God. So James, very great uh, presentation. I've got a small project that uh, no big Y member yet, so do you think there's a certain number of testees that should be in a project to do the big Y test? We've pretty much figured out the uh, terminal SNP, I think, but from just the uh, existing SNP packs. But what are the pros and cons of going to big Y for a small project? I'm not going to stand here and make any recommendations at all. It's big money. I'm very happy to talk to you afterwards about your particular circumstances and comment on a private basis. But when you're talking about $500 a time, that's an awful lot of money. And if you don't feel comfortable and you can handle the results, I think you would be awfully careful about recommending. I did, I only, of those 19 snips, I only recommended six. Oh, 19 big wires, I only recommended six. And that was after I'd worked out I could do it myself. Um, but if they want to do it, you recommend they don't do it. It's a slightly different question. That's their choice, of course, if they want to spend the money. Then you've got to say, well, if you do do it, I might be able to help or I can't help or you do this. I feel it's a big responsibility to give recommendations. Supposing the price came down, James, supposing it came down not by $100, but to $100, uh, I think we'd be in a much uh, oh. better position to recommend that everybody gets tested. In your ideal world, would you like to test everybody in your project using the big way? If I dreamt and went to heaven and was aged 40 <laughs> instead of mid-70s, absolutely. <laughs> but the thought of doing uh, 230 big Ys the way I've done these, oh no, thank you. <laughs> it is a lot, it is a huge amount of work, and I think we get that from, from the slides. Um, and certainly with my experience with the big Y, it is, it raises lots of questions. But it's like grey hairs, it will answer one question and then seven questions will sprout in its place. So uh, it's a little bit of a never ending story which is not too surprising in many ways. But um, uh, where do you think we're going to be in five years' time? Where do you think the Irwin project is going to be in five years' time? I'd rather you said five weeks than five years, but I'm not too, not too sure about that. <laughs> I'm going to Houston, and I'm going to give this talk in Houston. Now, that is, of course, the Mecca. I'm going to be talking to people who are uh, behind here. And they're away up there. They've been out for generations, and I'm going to be equally provocative. And if you don't shoot me down, they certainly will. Uh, but I do feel that this is this is um, citizen citizen what's the word? science citizen science. And I feel that I've been privileged to be a part of that, to actually experience the discovery to S and B's. Oh, <laughs> thank you, James, <laughs> and thank you for your enthusiasm. every step of the way behind you. Well. Thank you. <laughs> Very happy to take questions right at the back, but let's let the next the next lecture get on. James, I'll take the microphone back if you don't mind. I can't have to carry on <laughs> I once ended up within my yep. pocket. There it is. Yes, there it is. Yeah. That's it.